I'm going to leave the gate cracked open just a little bit in case. This is such a sweet idea. Made, uh oh, made us feel like we were at home. It's okay, I was standing on the wood. Merlin? That's one talented Merlin, isn't it? He's a magician. He's a magician. He's an absolute he magician. <laughs> Merlin, good job. Yeah. On the good job. Yeah, we want to say thank you to everybody that made this meeting possible from Pastor Isabel on down to all the volunteers, the people that are on staff, the people that love Jesus. And thank you for all that have come here. We're so grateful. Thank you. So it's my privilege at this time to turn the platform over to my precious once again. Isn't he a gift from heaven? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, gotcha. We have the technology, but without the anointing, it doesn't mean anything. That's right. Thank you again for the Awesome. Awesome. I'd like you to open your Bibles with me Turn this your evening your <laughs> to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. I want to talk to you about the fact that you may all prophesy. Yes. Amen. We were standing in the back just a moment ago talking about this, that the the Logos, which is the scripture, validates the Rhema. The Logos authenticates the Rhema. In other words, the scriptures, which are infallible, they're static, they are unchangeable, they are eternal, they apply. They, many times we try to interpret the Bible culturally, but the Bible... Rises up, scriptures rise above culture. We're, we're translating or interpreting the scripture at a very low level when we try to extract some cultural or what they call, those of you that are, have studied this, they call historical criticism, where we try to extract our understanding or modify our understanding of the Bible, kind of like the Constitution. Uh, I believe it was... Uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson who said that the Constitution is a living thing and it will mean different things in different <laughs> generations in American history. And we found that to be true. What the Constitution was construed to mean uh, when the Founding Fathers wrote it is not how it gets understood today. But that is not how the Bible works. The Scripture is eternal. The Scripture is infallible. But it's only one component. You know, there are those that, that use the term, they say, sola scriptura. And what that means is the Bible alone. I understand that because the Bible's been assaulted. But at the same time, if it was sola scriptura for how we look at the scriptures, then what do we need the anointing for? Why did Jesus in Ephesians 4 when he was leading captivity captives, said, hold on fellows, I'll be right back, and he gave gifts unto men. You see, so why, if where there is something that is beyond, or something that is extracted, or extrapolated, uh, out of that which the scriptures bring us, and we call that the ministry, we call that the anointing, we call that the teacher, and Jesus expressed one of the highest forms of where the Holy Spirit wants to take you, is that in that day you will need that no man teach you. See, if a teacher sees himself as being the end in itself, rather than bringing you to the place that you can listen to the Holy Ghost and be taught of the Lord Himself, Jesus did not die to teach you strictly or exclusively through the anointing of a teacher. God, He wants you to learn how to extract truth for yourself. A prophet 
is not here just to speak the word of the Lord to you. A prophet is here to help you hear the word of the Lord for yourself. And if we don't teach you how to hear the word of the Lord for yourself, one of two things. Either we are immature in our calling or we have committed malfeasance in the office that God has called us to. And a lot of prophets don't get that. A lot of prophets think they are an end in themselves. Even John the Baptist had a problem with that. He said, I must decrease that he may increase. But then the next time he talks to Jesus, he said, are you he that should come or I start looking for somebody else? <laughs> See, And he had to lose his head to get out of God's way. See, and there's, there's one thing when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, there is something powerful about thus saith the Lord. That's why prophecy has to be judged. Prophecy has to be judged. And did you know that you are the only one that can establish the value of the prophetic word that you receive? Yet at the same time, even in Paul's day, 1 Thessalonians 5.20, he said, despise not prophesying. In other words, I get that. I get that. The prophetic is a very subjective thing. But yet he wants us to stay open because God has a voice and he will not leave you without answers for your life. You know who your pastor is. See, the fivefold ministry. He didn't say the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, the, uh, you know, the pastor. Now, he's not optional, you know, like a steering wheel in the car. That's not an option. You've got to have that. But, uh, you know, prophets are like the sunroof. You don't have to have a sunroof to go, down, to go down the road. But that isn't what the scripture says. If we need pastors, we need prophets. Yeah. We need apostles. Yeah. Yeah. We need evangelists. Yeah. We need teachers. And uh, if you know, if you met somebody at the store and you need to find out they're a believer, you just see that look on your eye, you know, and you know they're a believer, and you get to talk, and they say, well, who's your pastor? And they say, excuse me? Well, who's your pastor? Well, I don't have a pastor. Didn't think I needed a pastor. Well, you might think that they love the Lord, but you might think, what are they going to do when life's pressures are upon them in such a manner that God intended pastors to be there to help them with that. You might think they might there might be a deficit in their life. Maybe even they might even be in a dangerous place. See? If they didn't think, well, what about if we need pastors, we also need prophets. Who is the prophet in your life? If you don't know, it's because you don't have one. And how's that working for you? He said, 2 Chronicles 20, 20, believe the prophets, so shall you prosper. Here we are in the modern world where the economies of the earth are not just struggling, the economies of the earth are being strained to the point where even our currencies are about to collapse. And what's the answer? The Word of God has the answer. Believe the prophets, but if the prophets are doing their job, it's not just believing a man, it's believing what the man is there to do, which is to relate you to the voice of God in your life. And when you hear the voice of God in your life, then you're going to know what it is to walk on water when everybody else is, is trying to hang on. Who is the prophet in your life? If we need, see, if we need pastors... We also need prophets. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul lists the nine gifts of the Spirit. And he states their purpose as being for your profit and your benefit. One of the things about the prophet is we got this idea that a prophet is there to point a finger at you, to judge you, to expose you, to say all these bad things about you, to step on your toes. God did not call us to step on toes. He called us to wash feet. Amen. See? And notice what he says, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. The, prof, the prophetic has had gotten a bad rap because of these guys who call themselves prophets. And while uh, Sister Victoria is over there playing the worship, and we're trying to worship God, the so-called prophet is stalking the aisles, stroking his chin. Who am I going to rebuke today? No way, Jose. And the guy, the, the Harvard Law School graduate, uh, we prophesied to, he said, now when do you tell the bad stuff? I said, oh no. 
Now, it's not that we don't see the bad stuff. That's right. But you don't need an anointing to know you're a rascal. You need no anointing from God to know you're in trouble if certain things don't get amended. And you're, you don't, what is it? It's the goodness of God, Romans 2, 4, that leads you to repent. See, yes, the prophet is about repentance. We want you to repent, so we're going to give you God's goodness. Yeah. We're going to speak God's goodness in your life. We're going to say, Jesus loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Amen. <laughs> we're going to speak the goodness of God into your life in such a way that you will turn and seek Him. And when you seek Him, you will see Him. And when you see Him, you'll you will be, be like, like Him. You will be as He is, Amen. for you shall see Him as He is, and you will be changed. And all of a sudden, you're you're not half the rascal you started out to be. <laughs> and God says, that's what I was after. Amen. Amen. That's good. First Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with. To profit. The gifts of the Spirit are to profit us. But we're so convoluted in our religious thinking that a church is not considered a church unless it's non-profit. What's wrong with that picture? <laughs> You see how Kitty's talked about the curse of the vow of poverty that so infected the church? Yeah. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another <coughs> faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of of tongues. So the knowledge gifts, the, the utterance gifts, speaking in tongues, interpretation, prophecy. In Second Chronicles 20, 20, Jehoshaphat declares, he said, if we believe the prophets, what happens? We prosper. Again, our verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 7-10 says, the gifts of the Spirit are given to profit you. That if you listen to the gifts of the Spirit, you allow them to have full sway in your life, that the water table of your life will be lifted to a higher place of blessing. If you know who your prophet is, and the prophets tend to ask you to do crazy things. They're besieged by the enemies of God in the city of Jerusalem, and the prophet says, don't send out the soldiers, send out, uh, send out Victoria. Victoria, we're just going to send you out there in the back of the pickup truck, and you just play, and it's going to be okay. <laughs> Hello. Believe the prophets, so shall you prosper. He said, hear me, O Judah, and inhabit this of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Many people are established, but they're not prospering. Amen. They've been taught to believe in the Lord, but he says, I also want you to believe in the prophets. It's two different things. What is it if you are established but not prospering? You're established, but you're on food stamps. You're established, but you can't answer your phone because the bill collectors are pounded down your door. Come on now. You're established. You know you're going to heaven when you die, but your life is hell in the meantime. Right. Come on now. Because being established in the Lord is one thing. God doesn't just want you to be established. He wants you to prosper. Amen. And you prosper by believing the prophets. But believing the prophets is not just what they say, but what they model. Wow. Allowing them to mentor you in hearing God for yourself. Yeah. The prophet who does not help you hear God for yourself has done you a great disservice <laughs> because you become externally dependent upon Him rather than internally dependent on the voice of God that speaks in the silence between your own yes. thoughts. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for See, idolatry proposes the dwelling place of God to be somewhere other than the human heart. Idolatry proposes external dependency upon God in someone else rather than internal dependency on who God is in your life. He did not die to relate to you through someone else or through external religious infrastructure. He died to relate to you from the inside of your human heart and to rise up and to manifest and show himself mighty in your behalf. Yes. See, in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, we find Jesus reinstituting, and notice this, he reinstitutes the office of the prophet in the five ascension gifts, what we call the fivefold ministry. Why did he reinstitute? We had prophets. We had prophets from Noah's time. Noah's, where's personal prophecy in the Bible? Well, where isn't it? Mm -hmm. Did you know that Adam prophesied? 
And said he gave names to all the animals. If you look at that, it means he prophesied. The Jewish mystics and the ancient Jewish scribes, they believed that what Adam actually did is he took each one of those animals and he prophesied over them. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to do. He spoke over them, they believed, by the power of prophecy. Noah, now you really <laughs> God even honored the personal prophetic word given by a drunk prophet. A prophet with an alcohol problem. Yeah. Noah had a problem with alcohol. Mm -hmm. And because of an incident in his family, due to his alcohol problem, he gave a prophecy over his boys, and his boy Ham had uh, shamed him, mm -hmm. had, uh, had uh, um, treated him wrong, and he had a boy named uh, Canaan. The oldest boy was Shem. And Noah gave a prophecy. He said, Shem will rule over Canaan and Canaan will be his servant. Canaan as in Canaanites. Canaan as in Canaan land. And ten generations later, an idolater by the name of Terah, Noah's great, 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 great grandson, he picks up his boy Abraham and moves out of Ur of the Chaldees because he was related to Shem and he knew Noah's word. Talk about warring with your words. Mm -hmm. First Timothy 1.18, war with your words. Terah took the prophetic word. Why else did Terah, you cannot find any reason why Terah moved with Abraham and Lot toward the promised land. They had their own land. But he knew that Noah said that Shem's descendants of which he was and Abraham was would rule over the Canaanites so they up and moved right smack dab in the middle of the Canaanites. Why? Because of a personal prophetic word. You realize Abraham's God's promise to Abraham was based on a personal prophetic word that a drunk prophet that had problems in his family gave to his oldest boy and God honored it. Who's with me? Yeah, we're with you. <laughs> And so, in Ephesians 4, we find Jesus. So we had prophets. We had prophets in the Old Testament. Why is Jesus reinstituting prophets? Very important to understand that Jesus reconstituted, he reconfigured what the prophetic is because there's a lot of people running around in the spirit of Elijah. <laughs> but what are you going to do with Revelations 19.10 that says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy? Amen. Now look, you're either going to be Prophesying in the spirit of Elijah or in the spirit of Christ, you can't do both. That's right, man. And in the spirit of Elijah, whether I call down fire from heaven, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. When they do that to you, just laugh at them. <laughs> <laughs> say, look at him, say, You're not my enemy, are you? God fights God against my, my enemies. enemies. I turn you over to the devil, to the destruction of your flesh and the saving of your soul. You know, Paul did that one time and never did it again. That's right. One time, and if you study the, the narrative of his life, it was months later that he wakes up and all of a sudden the messenger from Satan sent to buffet him. Uh oh. <laughs> Come on now. And there is not any other apostle or any of the apostles that Paul mentored that turned anybody over to the devil and the entire book of 2 Corinthians is Paul cleaning up the mess he made when he did that. Yes, he did. Sowing and reaping. So I had to turn you over to the devil, I laughed. I said, look, I'm not worried about the losing team. Amen. I'm not concerned about the playbook of the losing team. Don't turn me over to the devil. Turn me over to God. Amen. Remember David? Do you want to fall into the hand of man or the hand of God? Nathan asked him. Let me fall into the hand of God. And what happened at the end of him falling into the hand of God? He had the title deed to the real estate where the temple of Solomon was built. Amen. See, don't turn me over to the devil. Turn me over to God. He's bigger and I trust him. Amen. Now, how about you? Yep. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Not to do it for you, but to model for you how it gets done. What does a prophet do? He's not here to hear God's voice for you. He's here to model for you how to hear God's voice for yourself. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, Amen. for the edifying of the body of Christ. To help you hear God's voice. 
Now, if we already had prophets in the Old Testament, why did Jesus reinstitute them as one of the five office gifts? Answer. Because there is a difference between an Old Testament prophet and a New Testament prophet, and he's underscoring that by reinstituting the prophetic office in Ephesians 4. Let me read you a passage. Go to Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And it came to pass when the time has come that Jesus should be received up, he was steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him. Now if you go back and look, they are in exactly the same topography, the same physical location where Elijah called down fire and devoured several companies of 50 soldiers that the king of Samaria sent to go get Elijah. And they called down fire, and they called down fire, and they called down fire. And finally the last one came trembling and said, please don't call down fire. <laughs> I don't want to be barbecue today. And, and Elijah <laughs> went with them. But uh, they did not receive him, and the apostle James and John saw that the Samaritans did not receive Jesus. And he said, Lord, would you that we call down fire from heaven and consume them as Elijah did, as Elias did? He, he was standing on the promises. He was standing on the scripture. He had a scripture for it. And notice what he was, he was being a good scriptorian. And notice what he said, what Jesus said. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. What, what, why? They were moving in the spirit of Elijah. He said, you don't know what spirit you are of. He was not telling them, you're not being nice. He was saying that you don't know what spirit you're of. He said, you are moving in an old covenant paradigm. I want you to move in a new covenant paradigm. Because he says... He turned and rebuked them. He says, you don't know what spirit you're of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them, and they went to another village. So Jesus did not come to destroy, so we need to forget about people walking around in the spirit of Elijah, because the spirit of Elijah is that spirit that comes to destroy according to the law of sin and death that was given by Moses as our tutor to bring us to Christ, but now we are with Christ, and he came that we have life and life more abundantly, and his testimony of the prophetic according to Revelation 19.10 is now. the spirit of Christ, That's right. that we might have life, that we might have life more abundantly, yeah. All of his promises are yes and amen to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, they are. And his default answer toward us is yes. yes. And we don't have to overcome his reluctance to move in our behalf because he doesn't have any. Amen. Yeah. Amen. amen. <laughs> Good news. So in this passage, Jesus is reconfiguring the prophetic ministry. I tried to do this dry. <laughs> I just don't have dry in me. I came up in Pentecost, folks. Sawdust camp meetings. And I really do. I understand. How do you engage the intellect when the emotions are just... Help us, God. Mm -hmm. in, the, in this passage, Jesus is reconfiguring the prophetic ministry from an old covenant paradigm of judgment to a new covenant paradigm of grace. Can he do that? If you go read, make a note, do some homework, read Matthew 5. In Matthew 5, in no less than four places, Jesus made some statements. He said, you have heard it has been said, but I say unto you, what yes. was he doing? He was reconfiguring the economy of God. Yes, he was. He was reconfiguring the economy of God because he's God. He said, I'm God, I know more and I'm bigger than you are. Amen. That's what he tells me when I say why. Why? <laughs> because I'm God, I know more and I'm bigger than you are. Amen. You can ask why after you obey. Yep. Yeah. It's just when you ask why before you obey, He won't answer you. But if you ask why, if I just understood, I'd do what God said. <laughs> no, obey first. Amen. Ask questions later. Amen. And then He'll explain it to you. God, I have no idea how that worked. God, everything I touch is being blessed. Everything I say and do is as effective as if you said it or did it, and I have no clue how. why. It took me two years of listening to God before I started to understand why. God, I want to confess it's all working. It's working. I did do what you wanted, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So can I ask a question? Yes. Would you please explain this to me? Because I have no clue. If you want what you've never had before, you must be willing to go where you've never gone before and do what you've never done before. And in order to do what you've never done before, you have to begin to think, be thinking 
differently. Because what you're doing is producing what you're having. If you want something different, you must do something different. But if you're going to do something different, you've got to start thinking different. Yep. Yep. Because the kingdom doesn't come with observation. Mm -hmm. You must do something, even if you do it wrong, because God will make your mistakes to profit. Yes, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. See, he wasn't telling them they were in a demonic spirit. He said, you're trying to act in the spirit of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah, however, was concluded in the ministry of John the Baptist, of whom Jesus testified that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. So Jesus establishes that the new covenant prophetic is about saving men's lives according to a new covenant dynamic, not destroying men's lives according to an old covenant dynamic. And it really, really, really needs to be heard, folks. Yeah. Because there's a really bad reputation on the prophetic today. Come on. Because of those guys that run up while we were in a meeting. God sent us into a meeting in Branson. <laughs> And uh, there was a, God told us that pastor that's hosting that meeting, I'm going to restore a relationship there. We were there to restore a relationship, and it's been very sweet. God did it. But while we were there, one of these doom and gloom, judgment, point the finger, and rebuke people, prophets got in there, and, and he was stalking the aisle. Jesus. Oh, my God, rebuke today. Man, he uncovered his wife. He castigated his wife in front of everybody Forever. and uncovered her in a very ungodly way. Oh, all in his anointing. Not and while he's stalking the, the aisles, I told Kitty, I said, can I go just walk right behind and do the same thing? <laughs> no, dear. No. Can I stand up and, and, and rebuke him right now? <laughs> no, dear. You don't have permission to do that. <laughs> it was so difficult. <laughs> Because they, they're defaming the very one they claim to serve. Yep. Romans 2 4, it's the goodness of God. Prophet. Go to repent. I understand that. Give them God's goodness. Maybe they will. Mm -hmm. Revelation 19 10. He said, I felt, John saying, I fell at his feet and I worshiped him. See that you do it not. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So a New Testament prophet is to minister in the spirit of Christ and not in the spirit of Elijah. 1 Corinthians 14.3 Let's see what New Testament prophetic looks like. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. You need to desire to prophesy. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him. Howbeit he that... In the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he that prophesies, and here's the definition of prophecy, speaks unto men unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. Yeah. If you're not edifying, exhorting, and comforting, I don't know what you're doing, but it's not prophecy. Mm -hmm. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. The word comfort here, I like it. It means to comfort, to console, to stimulate, to give incentive, to incentivize. Mm -hmm. To incentivize. Ooh, I like that. Go incentivize somebody. Stir somebody up Amen. to charge hell with a water pistol full of gas. Come on. <laughs> Stir somebody up like Samson took the two foxes' tails and tied them together, set them on fire, sent them through the enemy's barley field. Man, we're going to do something if we do it wrong because God even makes our mistakes <laughs> to prosper. Got bail money, tell them. <laughs> one of the number one needs that a pa that pastors deal with is a lack of motivation and incentive among God's people. Pastor has church on Sunday and half the people show up. Where are they? They need to be incentivized. Whose job is that? The prophetic. Yep. The prophetic is there to help in that matter. Where's all the people? Man, can't get anybody out. Got to mow the grass. We need to do... There's just no incentive in this congregation. What's the answer? The prophetic. That's right. We need the prophets. We need the prophetic to come and incentivize the people. We are to edify. Not tear down. To exhort, not to demean. To comfort, not to discourage. To edify, exhort, and comfort. Not rebuke, repudiate, or excoriate one another. Why? In order to bring repentance. Yes, the world needs to repent. How are we going to get them to? Romans 2, 4. Do you despise the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance? Amen. What's the world need to do? Repent! How are they going to do it? Give them God's goodness. We gave them the law, but the law and that it was imperfect because it depended upon the will of man. 
God in sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh fulfilled the law and now obedience comes out of the grace of God and the transforming spirit of the Holy Ghost released upon us among other ways through the prophetic and through His voice that causes us to come to Him and when we come to Him we see Him as He is we become like Him and all of a sudden we are changed into another man and another people and the world out there with no answers looks at us and says please take me to your leader yes Amen. Let's have that. Let's have that. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> Two important things you need to know. Number one, God wants you to receive and to give prophecy. Yep. Number two, God wants you to know who the prophet is in your life. In Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, Jesus gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to you. You know who your pastor is, or at least you should. Who is your prophet? If you don't know, it's because you don't have one. And how's that working for you? Are you prospering? Maybe you are. But you're not prospering near as much as you would if you had a prophet in you who was activating the voice of God in you so you could hear God for yourself and helping you hear God with clarity whenever you're so conflicted about what's going on in your life that you can't hear for yourself. Are you walking fully in God's blessing and purpose for your life? If pastors are not optional in the Christian experience, then prophets likewise are not optional. In fact, we need all five of the fivefold ministry gifts so that we can grow up into the full measure of the stature of Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, a prophet is not an end in himself. He's supposed to be modeling something for you. Right. Specifically, how to hear from God. Which brings us to, again, another important thing you need to know. God wants you to receive and to give prophecy. A prophet who does not teach you how to hear from God is not doing his job. That's right. The purpose is not to rely on God and the prophet, but to rely on God in your own life. Amen. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God would make known the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is your hope of glory. Christ in me is not your hope of glory. Christ in me will only take you so far. Yeah. Christ in you is your hope of glory. Yeah. And we need to get that activated and get you related to who he is in your own life. Yeah. And then you're not going to be walking around thinking that you know, all this false advertising. Uh -huh. How come it's not working? Christ in me is your brother. Christ in you is your father. Christ in you is your hope of glory. Christ in me is not your hope of glory. Why is that important? Because Philippians 4.19 says that he'll meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. And if you're looking at the glory in me, your needs are not going to get met from the glory in me. Your needs are going to get met from the glory in you. That's right. And we want to turn you, to turn your face to the glory that's in you. The glory that Moses turned to when he stood in the door of the tabernacle and he would turn around and his face would shine like a searchlight over the yeah. people. Amen. Where you are changed into another man because you've been exposed to the glory of God that Jesus died to deposit on the inside of you. Every prayer you will ever pray, the answer is on the inside of you in embryo. And if you learn how to turn to that glory and put your expectations upon that glory, something's going to begin to happen. And everything you say and do is going to begin to be as effective as if God said it or did it. And the world will be a path to your door because you're getting your prayer. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Father. So that glory is many things, but it is also very much a voice that God wants to acquaint you with. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 14, 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you prophesy. How many here speak in tongues? How many here speak in tongues when you want to? I can speak in tongues when I want to. 1 Corinthians 14, 31 says, I'll read verse 1 again, Follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you prophesy. God wants you to prophesy. For you prophesy, for all may prophesy that you may learn, that all may learn and all may be comforted. Now, if all are not capable, trained, and activated, then needs remain unmet in our midst. That God is on hand and is willing 
to address. See, you can and should and are encouraged in the Bible to receive prophecy and to give prophecy. First Thessalonians 5.20, despise not prophesying. First Corinthians 14.31, you may all prophesy. Now he said in uh, 1 Corinthians 20, do all prophesy? No, they don't. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people take that and say, see, I don't have to prophesy. There's my out. <laughs> but yet he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 30, 31, says that you may all prophesy. And he said, desire to prophesy. Desire spiritual gifts. How are we going to get there? <laughs> if somebody's not teaching it, if somebody's not modeling it. You know, William Branham, he was, if there was ever a New Testament prophet in our midst, it was William Branham back in the 1940s and 50s. But Branham, uh, later on in his life, he got a little off, off the mark. <laughs> And he made this, I remember my dad was in a William Branham meeting. He told the story about a little lady came up and said, Brother Branham, I have a word for you. And it was right before he died. And he said, what? Wouldst thou prophesy to the prophet? Oh. And, and mark my word, I have deep, deep respect for William Branham. I've listened to hundreds of hours. I've actually spent years, years, literal years listening to his teachings and listening to his anointing. When blinded eyes were open, when he would call people out and give words of knowledge at a depth, a level of accuracy that would just stun you. People coming out of wheelchairs. But let me tell you something. God wants you, the prophet's job is to teach you how to hear from God for yourself. The prophet who does not do that is either immature, or he does not understand his calling, or worse. And I don't care what his reputation is, or say, okay, well, you can prophesy, but no dates, mates, geographical moves, or babies. You just excluded almost every prophetic word given in the scripture. We would not have 66 books of the Bible if we followed the prophetic schools that are more concerned about their reputation than about seeing people brought to breakthrough. Yep. Come on. In 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul told Timothy, he said, stir up the gift of God that is in you by the putting on of my hands. There's a lot of different ways. Paul was known to lay hands on people and receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Among other ways gifts can be imparted is through prayer, but also through the laying on of hands. The gifts of God inherent in the Holy Spirit on the inside of you can and should be stirred up as an act of obedience. That word means to kindle, to stir up, to inflame, to bring to life. You know, usually <laughs> you begin to move in the gifts in your church and somebody's got there, like there's like a deacon who's assigned with a fire extinguisher and every time God, the gifts of God begin to move, somebody uh -oh. says, put that out! Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's more concerned about their reputation. You know, you, you got visitors in church and sure enough, Sister Smith is going to do her thing. You know? <laughs> Ooh, no. Everybody said, oh, did she have to do it with visitors? And said, oh. Go, God. God wants you to stir up the gifts that are in you. Yeah. Gifts can be cultivated. Mm -hmm. Hearing from God can be taught. We need to lose the medieval superstitious yeah. ways where we interact with the prophetic more like they're clairvoyants and psychics yeah. than they are than it is the gift yeah. of God down on the inside of you that God wants to use to yeah. put you over Amen. your arms. Amen. Honor him. Mm -hmm. That's right. Lastly, remember that in our opening passage we talked about the nine gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. In our Pentecostal heritage, we delineate or we set tongues apart in a way that they are not distinguished in Scripture. Just like the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Pastors are non-optional. Everything else is like a moon roof. You don't have to have it. <laughs> you can take it or leave it. But why doesn't, why doesn't it say that? Come on. The nine gifts of the Spirit. We have all these gifts and say, well, I can pray in tongues when I want to, but then other gifts, you may never move in them. Let me tell you something. If you can pray in tongues when you want to, you can prophesy when you want to. Yes. You can perform miracles when you want to. Yes, amen. Really? When Paul talked to the Galatians, he said he was making a point about 
grace versus works. He says, he that worketh miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith? And then he said, he that works miracles among you, everybody that read that letter had to turn around and looked at that guy. Because there was a guy who could move in miracles at will. It didn't say he that's getting miracles every once in a while. No. He that, there was somebody that was so fluent in the working of miracles, he pushed the envelope, didn't take no for an answer until he was moving in the gift of miracles at will. Amen. And if you can pray in tongues at will, then you can prophesy at will. You can heal at will. Amen. And if you cannot do that, then the tongues that you are praying in, in, in at will are not true tongues from God. And we better sure enough be reconnected. We better go talk to that guy, who John MacArthur, who says that we're all doing something that is not scriptural. Wow. So unless we're willing to jettison our renewalist faith, our full gospel faith, we have to come back and say, I can pray in tongues when I want to. Therefore, the potential is there to heal at will, to make yes. miracles at yes. will, to prophesy at will. Yes. Amen. 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 Yes, his will. Amen. See, when you started out in Christ, you weren't speaking in tongues, but then that gift came. Now, for the most part, you can speak in tongues at will. The early Pentecostals didn't think you could. Right. Pentecostal tradition says you get there's the tongues you speak at baptism, then there's intercessory tongues. I don't got my praying language yet. Then there's the prayer language. How many old time charismatics we got here? Mm -hmm. Then there's Not groaning that, that cannot be uttered. And then Not we that just old. classify that a lot of different ways so that we give ourselves an exception why we don't have something. But the scripture doesn't delineate them that way. It mm -hmm. groups them all together. And what's true of one gift is true of them all. And that's what growing up into the full measure of the stature of Christ looks like. That's what the greater works look like Come on. that Jesus spoke about. Come on now. So you can speak in tongues at will. And what's true of one gift is true of another. If you can speak in tongues when you want to, you can move in prophecy when you want to. And again, Paul said, do all prophesy? Implying that all did not. But 1 Corinthians 14.30 says, all may prophesy. And in verse 1 he said, in fact, we should desire, and 2 Timothy 1.6 says we should covet to prophesy. Mm -hmm. Unless we choose to exempt ourselves for an unbiblical reason. Mm -hmm. The Lord asks me all the time, he says, you've got to make up your mind if you believe this stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe this stuff, right before our ministry launched, I prayed my way through the entire book of Psalms. And I said, God, you did this for this man, and if you're not going to do it for me, I'm throwing my Bible in the dumpster. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't dealing with God, I was dealing with me. Mm -hmm. I was dealing with the depth of hypocrisy that reads this stuff, but doesn't believe it. Yeah. Come on now. That can sign to make some sort of excuse for having an experience that is somewhat less than what Jesus died to provide. Yeah. That's the truth. We should all covet to move in the power of God. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Get rid of the idea. So many times people come and they're looking for a psychic reading. They're looking for a clairvoyant reading. They interact with the prophets. Yeah. Well, if you don't tell me something I know you wouldn't already know, then I'm not going to accept it. But if you read 1 Corinthians 14, it says that the word of knowledge component in a prophecy is for the unbeliever. <laughs> Come on. And I hear the prophetic schools today, they say, if there's not a word of knowledge component in a personal prophecy, it's not of God. That's a lie. That's right. Because if having a word of knowledge is like Thomas saying, if I can't put my finger in the wounds, I'm not going to believe. If a prophet gets up and tells you your social security number, it doesn't take any faith to believe what he says next. The word of knowledge component is for those that do not believe. And if you have to have a word of knowledge component in order to receive a prophecy, uh -oh. then I need you to sign a decision card and we'll see if we have a pastor here that can get you baptized and we want you to come and know Jesus as your Savior. Let's grow up, people. Come on. Let's grow up. Say, well, if the prophecy doesn't come to pass, it's a false prophet. That's not true. Because Jesus gave a prophecy that never did come to pass and it never will come to pass. He prophesied to the twelve, including Judas, you're going to sit on twelve thrones judging Israel. And Judas opted out because that prophecy that Jesus gave was provisional and it was conditional. Do you judge the rebellious spirit of the people by the prophet or do you judge the prophet by the rebellious spirit of the people? Hello. All prophecy is conditional and provisional. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. That's right. And God wants us to grow up. 
Yeah. In these things. If somebody moves in a healing ministry and they lay hands on you and you don't get healed, does that mean they're a false healing ministry? No. Mm. We know other things are involved. See, God wants us to press in. It's not about who's at fault. Let's quit leveling blame. Yeah. Let's just keep pressing in. Let's keep loving one another. And pressing in until we experience the fullness of everything that Jesus died to give us. Yes, Lord. Amen. All of it, Father. Who's the prophet in your life? Are you willing to desire to prophesy? To come with his prophecy, it's real simple. Hearing God's voice and sharing what you hear for the benefit of others and your own benefit. Mm -hmm. It's real simple. It's nothing medieval about it. Nothing superstitious about it. Nothing psychic about it. No way. It's hearing God's voice and sharing what you hear for your own benefit and the benefit of others. I believe if you will approach these questions with humility and willingness, that God will place that gifting in your midst and the result will be prosperity and blessing at a level you have yet to experience, though in fact it is your heritage and your blood-bought entitlement in the shed blood of Amen. Bow your heads with me. Thank you, Father. God, I release and I impart to this people the prophetic. If Paul could lay hands on Timothy and impart gifts, God, by the words of my mouth, you said I could give away anything you've given me. God, I give them all I've got. Right now, by the words of my mouth, by the authority that's invested in me as a believer, I speak an impartation of the prophetic. I speak an impartation of the gift of wisdom. I speak an impartation of the word of knowledge. I speak an impartation of the gift of healing and gift of miracles over these people right now in the name of Jesus. They'll begin to perform miracles. They'll begin to lay hands. They'll begin to speak words of prophecy. They'll begin to have tongues and interpretation in their midst. God, let the gifts of the Spirit be restored to the church. Let church as performance and church as dead religious exercise come to its cessation. And Father God, let a new, vibrant, Holy Ghost church rise up and be led by the apostles that are in our midst. Let the movement, God, that you are here to bring about, let it begin here. Let it begin here. God, that you would press yourself upon these people and manifest and make yourself known to them in a supernatural way. As speak an impartation. They will prophesy. They will speak in tongues. They will lay hands and the sick will recover. If they take up any daily thing and shall not harm them, they're going to have a water walking testimony. It is their portion, Father God, and it begins here and it begins now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we it to be so. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. How's that for good news? Yeah. The gospel's good news. Yes, it is. It gets better and better. Yes, God. Praise the Lord. Um, I want to. You want me to do what you asked me to do earlier? Oh, well, is there something else you'd like to do? Were you going to do a group? I thought that you want to do that. Okay, let's do then, this one then first. Then we'll move to the other. Yeah. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do a tongue, and we're going to ask you for the interpretation. So I'm going to speak in tongues, and then there'll be about maybe seven, I think is a good number. Seven of you, I want you to get an impression of what you feel that was about. And by the time we get through the seven, we'll have a whole thought from God. Oh, it's really fun to do. So here we go. Korabashata esinurimba estela. Baramahanda e oje. Lala no kusa ramanda se. Purushtone esela matila ma o rahasa. Babaranda ko ramasi. Namor tutra degolo ibrana eso trambasi. doesn't take long. I want seven of you to raise your hand and say, this is the part I have. Sister, stand up and say. This is the part I have. I released you, said God. I released you this day to go forth in me. That's awesome. Next. Amen. What an impression. That's excellent. Excellent. Yes, sister? I love you with the everlasting love, said the Lord. I love you with the everlasting love. Glory to God. That's him. That's him. Yes, sister? I love you because I am your father, your Abba, Abba Father. 
come to me and I will hold you in comfort and walk with you. Excellent. That sounds just like him. Julie. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Wow. Glory to God. Come on. That's about four of you. Okay, Trace. Uh, let him that has, has an ear to hear what the Lord is saying. Glory. Mm -hmm. It's true. I'm doing a new thing in Glory. Oh, new thing. Let's have one more. <laughs> Come on. You're doing, you're good at wow. this. Yes, sister. And out of your belly shall flow rivers of living. Right. How? Oh. Amen. Yes. Glory to God. Yes. Praise him. Yes. That's just how it works. Yes. Amen. He flows. He flows yes. like a river. Russ always tells it, you know, it's not a metaphor for a river. It's a river. You know, open the floodgates and let him flow. Let him out. He's been held in far too long, this precious Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to get my recorder turned on. And I would like to prophesy like to... I, I got it. You want to hold it? I have to. Okay. Um, I'd like to prophesy, if I may, to Tracy's friend, Kathy. Can I give you a word of encouragement? Is that okay? This is for Kathy. This is for Kathy. She's got backup. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I need backup. You're so strong, you don't need a backup. But Kathy, as I started to pray for you, this is what I heard the Lord say. The Holy Spirit is infectious, but He's better than a virus. Because uh, you've made a choice in your heart to hang out with God, and um, he, your heart is really tender towards the Father. That's what He told me. And he said that um, you're going to be, you, you have such a hunger for him that it's going to, it's feeding you, even as you think a thought about God, you, it's feeding you. And the, the Bible said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. So it's while you're thinking on him and while you're meditating on him and his word and hanging out with his folks that uh, you're being filled because he has a purpose to overflow from you and share you as a contagion with other people. So he's going to reveal Holy Spirit to many other people because you came to him. And this is how I saw it in the Spirit. Uh, there's, a, there's an arch up here. And you walk under the arch, but up top it says called. And you saw, you heard, you sensed that God wanted you. And you came to him one day. So you went under that little arch that said called. And you get a few steps on the other side and you turn back and, and the arch says chosen. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you are seriously chosen and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And not just for your own benefit, which is awesome to be a child of God, but for the benefit of others. And sometimes you're just going to touch somebody, hug somebody, and uh, they're going to feel the warmth of God and they'll say, what is that? I got goosebumps on top of my goosebumps. And um, sometimes it's going to just be a smile. But you are infectious with the Holy Spirit because you've been hanging out with God and you know Him by the Spirit and He loves you so much. And your tender heart is a, a bright and shining light for the Father. And Kathy, I heard the Lord say the words to me, healing leaves, healing leaves. Mm. And I know by, I am aware that there was a, uh, a periodical that was published in the early days of the 1900s by a group that spoke in tongues and believed in healing. And it was called Healing Leaves. And you can actually Google it and get facsimiles of it to read. And I heard the Lord saying to encourage you to seek that out. Because as you begin to read it, you'll see some of these testimonies of just wonderful, sweet things that God did. Test it was all about just giving testimonies. And the Lord says, you're going to get a picture. He says, that's the template that I'm working from to bring you into the culture of the kingdom. Wow. I'm bringing you into the culture of my kingdom, says the Father. And I'm going to establish a testimony in your life, not just of talking about, but a, t a testimony of demonstration. I will demonstrate myself because what people can be talked into, they can be talked out of. But God says, you're going to know what it is to walk in demonstration. And that's going to be a sweet little research, investigation, and homework to get an idea says the father i got a big idea about you and i want you to see what i've got in mind for you says the father thank you lord glory to god bless you kathy thanks for coming okay the next word i have is for i think debbie i asked you if we'd met before you can just stand up back there debbie yeah, when I saw her from a distance, this I, is for Debbie. I just felt like I knew her, and, and I guess it's because we're from the same tribe of God, and we know each other by the Spirit, but 
Debbie, you're refreshing. Um, what I heard the Father say is you're a force to be reckoned with in your community. That there's this fire of God that he's going to spread out throughout your community. And you're a huge um, fire starter. That the Spirit of God is so rich and is so loved by you that you're gonna, He's going to make the Holy Spirit known in your community. You know, for years and years, everybody just said we only should talk about Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. And, and then for a long season, we've talked about get to know your Father. But it's time for the Holy Spirit to be honored in the earth again. Amen. When Jesus went away, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to come to you. So we know it's the Trinity of God. And the Holy Spirit wants to like roll through your town like a combine. Mm -hmm. And you're going to know it. You're going to begin to sense it. And you're going to have some of the same reactions that little Kathy's going to have. As people will pass you by and they'll just know something. Or they'll feel God and they'll say, hey, lady, what is that? Because you can feel God, you can feel an anointing. Some chauffeur uh, met us out on the street one day and he said, Sir, I don't know you, but you're anointed. It's like, let's have some of that in our towns. Amen? That the beauty of Christ is in you and on you. And so God's going to make himself known. He's going to karevishana. He's going to announce you through by the Holy Spirit to your community, your county. We were talking earlier where you live. He must be heard and he must be seen and you're going to help to demonstrate and you're going to draw attention back to them and introduce them to the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Before you do that, tell, yeah. the, tell the, the combine story. Just for Jim. Oh, and really? Jim, tell that he wants me to tell you a funny that happened in our last meeting. All right. <laughs> so we had a hundred and, not, not here, but yeah, 140 people in Branson about three weeks ago. And we're so thankful. People come from all over the world sometimes just for a three-day meeting. Only God could ask somebody to do that, and they do it. It just amazes us. So one of our prophets that graduated from our prophetic school is so precious, and she is not afraid to give prophetic words. But we've just started using her in the service. Like if we get a, kind of out of breath, we'll say to sister, please stand up. Should I say her name? Lisa Coburn. Oh, it's too late. We Lisa threw her Coburn. under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> we threw her under a bus. No. So she is, uh, she's exercising. You know, we had a lot of students. We could have asked Tracy to stand up, but she could have prophesied to everybody in the house. This girl right here. So we asked them to prophesy. So we, uh, I picked a gal, and I, I said, one over here whispered in her ear, Lisa, when they're done with this prophecy, why don't you go prophesy this young lady? On the front row, she said, no problem. So she goes over there, and she starts out, and is just anointed. And she said, um, I'm trying to get the second word. I know the, the first word. She said, and I see you going through a field like a concubine. And I said, <laughs> and I said combine, combine, combine. I said, what are you doing? Oh, color her heart. Knows what we're all about. <laughs> That's a perfectly innocent thing to do. Oh, she's one of our main. She's a main vendor. Yeah, awesome you might get prophet. a prophesy from her. A prophecy from her. It was hilarious because we've we've done stuff like that. The first job I had in Branson, I went to work as a hotel manager. It was a real long name. It was the Outback Roadhouse Motel and Suites. And my first phone call came in. I was kind of nervous. I said. Roadhouse. God knows we're human, but he uses us anyway. He chooses to use us, glory to God. Okay, this couple over here. Now, sister, I think you told me you had to run today a whole bunch of miles. 14 she, miles you ran 14 miles, and she said, if I can make it, I'll be there. I'd like to prophesy to you, sis. What's your first name? Diane. Okay, you want to stand up, Diane, and I'll look at my note. This is for Diane. Diane, I heard the Holy Spirit say, I, I love this one. She's, gonna, she's a runner, and she's going to run faster, farther, but faster than the average person. It has nothing to do with the timing of a race like you might have done, but it's about um, exponential um, accomplishment of the things of the Spirit. That there's some things that a lot of people take years and years to learn, but you catch them intuitively by the Spirit, and you're going to just start catching. Like, you've caught something in this, this little conference we're having here, thanks to Pastor Isabel. And he's going to have you 
extract that quickly, and you're going to have seed fruit harvest, seed fruit harvest, because he's going to run you farther a whole lot faster. There's something that we pray for people if they want it, and we'll tell them it's the sooner, not later prayer. And God is just saying, I'm going to move in your life much sooner than you expected, faster than you ever dreamed. So he wants you to fasten your spiritual seatbelt, but then it, get ready at any time for hear that little click sound, take it off, and go for it. Because he's going to... Um, He's going to multiply himself into the earth because of your willingness to speak on his behalf, to, to reach out to somebody else on his behalf. He said, I'm not about to let that go to waste. I'm not about to let the vessel of honor that you are to be wasted. I want you broken and spilled out because that's where I'm smelt. I, that's where I'm felt. You have an aroma about your life that people are going to ask you what your fragrance is. And you're going to tell them it's the Rose of Sharon. It's the Lily of the Valley. Because your life is a beautiful thing to the Father. So He's going to take you farther a whole lot faster. In Jesus' name. Uh, what I want you to do is uh, I've got one for somebody. Mm -hmm. And while I'm doing that one, I want you to get something for the next one. I'm, I'm running out of energy here. And yeah, well, I won't do more. Than, okay. We won't do more than about five. I know we probably have about two more. And then I decided I'm going to do one more. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm with you. So if you the lady next <laughs> I agree. To I agree. The lady next to Debbie, <laughs> <laughs> who helped with the prophetic interpretation. Would you remind us of your name again, sis? Pam. Pam. This is for Pam. <clears throat> Pam, the scripture says, First apostles, secondarily prophets. I'm sorry. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. God says, guess which one I have called and ordained for you to live in. God says, you're prophetic. Amen. God says, you have prophetic gifting upon your life. God says, you are a Nabi prophet. Now, there's a difference. There is a seer anointing, but then there is what they call the Nabi. That's a, that's a Hebrew word, and it means to bubble. <laughs> You're like Perrier. The Lord said, <laughs> there's a bubbling on the inside of you. But people, you know, seers are easy to teach because they see. And with those who, who are, are not primarily seers, and that doesn't mean you won't see. For me... I, I'm a Nabi prophet. I get it. I, I hear it. It bubbles up on the inside of me. It coalesces on the inside of me. But then uh, there are times where actually when I get in front of people, that's when I'm not with you. But when I am with you, I, I see. I, I see it. I say, God, how come I, I get it by the Nabi dynamic when I'm not in front of people, but when I'm in front of people, I see. I thought there was some deep understanding of that. He says, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> and uh, the Lord says, there is a Nabi effervescent deep water spring of the Holy Ghost Hallelujah. that's down deep into the fissures and aquifers of the Spirit that I have caused you to be, says the Father. And you're going to begin to discern and you're going to begin to give forth and you're going to begin to pour forth and you'll be in the midst of the people, says the Father, and it'll just begin to flow out of you, even that effervescent voice of the Holy Ghost that will make the atmosphere become charged, says the Father, with my presence that will destroy fear, that will destroy unbelief, says the Lord, and that anointing is coming upon you today, and it's going to be an anointing of healing, an anointing of breakthrough that will wash and that will cleanse, right? I have called you to be the priest of the well of living water that I put on the inside of you. And it's not just a well, but it's a river, says the Father, that will go out into many lands, says the Lord, and water dry places, says the Father. God bless you. Okay, this is okay. I want to prophesy to the sister in the red jacket. Would you remind me what your first name is? Fran. Fran. Uh -huh. Go ahead, stand up, Fran. This is for Fran. <laughs> You're so cute. She talked to me earlier. She's dreamed about me. <laughs> so there's an activation for you because you dreamed. 
And the prophetic is at work, whether you're awake or whether you're asleep. The Spirit of the Lord says, Fran, uh, I've got so much invested in you. It's like backed up like the L.A. freeway at 5 o'clock, bumper to bumper. I have my words on the inside of you, and I've invested a lot in you. And I've poured a treasury into the inside of you, and I'm not about to waste it. I don't know what you, age you are, but the Lord said, don't even think about age, don't even look at the age, because all things are being made new today. You've got a breakthrough of health and strength. You're going to run and not be weary, friend. You're going to walk and not faint, because he is not willing to take what he invested on the inside of you and put a lid on it. He says, I want you to stand up like I just said. I want you to open your mouth and let it fly because you have edification, exhortation, comfort to give to many people. And sometimes that's all they need is just a little word of encouragement. They go for the next 10 years. It worked that way for me. I just needed to hear what the Lord was saying and I could carry on. Uh, one time he said, he told me my name from a prophet and she was from another state. I said, God, it really is written in your book. Tell the people that God loves them. He's got a wonderful plan for their life. And he said, I'm going to draw out from you. It's like dipping um, water from a well with this wonderful cup. And he said, you know, the, the rope's really short. You don't have to dip very far because it's right there on the surface of you. Be bold and be very courageous and say, God, give me that mountain because I want to do all that you put in my heart to do. I want to be faithful. I want Jesus to get what he paid for. So be faithful and go for it. You're going to be God's, you go girl. That's what you're going to be. <laughs> Okay, is it uh, Lat Latanya? Oh, Latanya. Good. Thank you, God. Latanya. This is for Lat Latanya. Latanya, as I looked at you, I saw a picture of one of these uh, places where you get your oil changed and you pull in and they have the little rack and it picks the car up. And I see the Lord, it's like you're that car. And he's picking you up. He said, you're getting ready for a pickup. But not only getting ready for a pickup, and I don't mean a pickup truck. But he's getting ready, he's going to pick you up, says the Father. And I see him coming into your life and he's going to change your oil. He said, I'm going to bring the new oil, the fresh oil of my spirit into your life. And you're going, to, you're going to get more done. There are things that you've done that's been a lot of heat and pressure. A lot of heat and pressure. But I'm about to change all that, says the Father. Because I'm bringing the oil of my spirit online in your life. And he says some of the pressure, the pressing that you've been through, oil comes from pressing. And you've been on the, the olive press of my spirit. And like Gideon, sometimes you've been threshing out wheat behind the wine press. And God, where's the joy? And where's all the promises? God, you made some promises to me. And the Father says, Go in this thy might, and uh, the Lord will be with you, and you will accomplish even now in this season things that haven't been working are going to start working. You're going to turn back to some, what seems like some failed strategies. God, I did that. God, I read that book. God, I did this. I did that. It didn't work. God says, I'm going to turn you back to some of that, and there's going to be a repetition and a renewal, and all of a sudden, I just see fireworks going off all around you because it's a celebration of your personal independence, says the Father. I'm moving in your life in a supernatural way, and I'm going to give you an open door into the marketplace. I don't know what you do for a living, but the Lord says, I'm opening the door in the marketplace, and you're going to walk in the kingdom in the mountain of business. You're going to walk in the kingdom in the public square in a supernatural way. I see you dressed smartly and you've got some nice little jewelry on and you look like you're ready to close a real estate deal. And the Lord says uh, I'm going to give you the inheritance. I'm going to give you the inheritance of the heathen as your, as, as your entitlement, says the Father. And there will be many, many, many that will be affected and see my blessing upon your life. The Lord says it's a new day. I'm putting the signet. I'm putting my signet of upon you, yes. says the Father, oh, and the devil, the Holy Spirit, is resting upon you in a supernatural way for a new walk, yeah. says the Lord. Okay, uh, got a message up front here that Isabel, your son and daughter-in-law, has come in. Yes. Can we speak over you guys?
that we speak over you? I don't know. <laughs> it won't hurt a bit. <laughs> well, she is. Duh. <laughs> she is wild. And uh, sir, what's your name? Anthony. Anthony. That's a good name. What's your name, huh? Grace. Grace. This one for Anthony Grace. Great combo. Yeah. Come on over right here. See, this is perfectly painless. <laughs> Nobody has been harmed in this meeting. As our disclaimer, nobody has been wounded or <laughs> Anthony and Grace. Are you married? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> do you want to be? So. Yeah, do you want to be? Because we do weddings. <laughs> we do generals too. Is that it, Rob? <laughs> um, the Lord just has a, a blessing for you. He blesses the strength of your life. Um, have you heard the expression, a nut doesn't fall far from the tree? Yes. <laughs> well. <laughs> oh, mama. Uh, who's your mama? Going, going. <laughs> who's your daddy? <laughs> your life is, uh, number one, it's blessed because you're in the family you're in. You're blessed because of the inheritance that you have. There's a nice natural inheritance, which is great, but there's a spiritual inheritance that's better. And God has some wonderful things planned for your life. He plans on um, showing you off in the kingdom of God. As you look to Him and you're trusting in Him, He's going to make everything you do prosper. Everything you set your hand to will prosper as you get it from God. And He will begin to demonstrate. And it's not because of your mama's being so awesome and your daddy. It's because of who Christ is on the inside of you that you won't deny Him. So He won't deny you. Anything that you need, you can tap in and talk to Father God and He'll bring it to you. He will make it clear to you. It's his goodness that brings you to life. His very goodness. Anthony, uh, sometimes we see things. It's not like always an open vision. That does happen once in a while. But we see things in our mind, suggestion in our imagination that God puts there. And I saw you. I don't know what you do for a living. But I saw you like you were up in an office overlooking like a manufacturing plant. Now that might just represent something. But I asked, well, what's that all about? He says, that's about promotion. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that you do for a living, the Father says, my plan for your life is that you'll be supervising, be promoted to a place of supervising others, many others that are doing what you do for a living. In other words, the Lord says, vocationally, I want to take you up to the next level. And whatever your life looks like in terms of... Uh, you know, your personal economy, your personal, you know, where you live, what you drive. God says, I'm coming up underneath you to bring promotion, to bring improvement. I'm going to give you favor. There's some things. You have an ability. You are capable of doing a whole lot. I've got a good friend of mine who is doing a job that he is, like, uh, overqualified for. God says, I'm going to take that. And, and, and it, really, you've experienced some of that and the frustration that comes with that. It's like, God, I'm... I can do so much more than this. And the Lord says, I'm about to bring you into a place that you're going to feel like, I don't know if I'm qualified for this. But the Lord says, yes, you are. Yeah. And there's going to be, and, and it's not like some promotion that comes when you get more responsibility but not more pay. Well, that's not a promotion. <laughs> and uh, the Lord says, uh, I'm going to see that you're, you're going to be able to find the pay window. For I'm putting a, a blessing upon you. I have a purpose and a plan for your life. I'm going to show you what cooperation looks like. And your name again? Grace. 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 Uh, I don't know a whole lot about music, but I do know when you tune a piano, you use a tuning fork. And when you get the right sound, there's like a resonance that takes place. And when it comes to the things of God, we're kind of like that. And the way God made us, we're like a tuning fork. And when God's presence comes near to us, or when we begin to walk in the very core reason, you begin to walk in life, and like in your destiny, then you begin to vibrate inside. There's something just resonant and full and sweet. You come into this sweet spot. God says, you're like my tuning fork. Yeah. And I'm going, you have a real guidance system. And God <laughs> intends for wives to be like that. They're a real guide. You know, she says, I, I don't think you ought to do that. And then I, later on she says, I told you so. And uh, the Lord says, there's an internal guidance system that I have been developing in you for a long time. And I'm going to begin to speak to you. I'm going to begin to communicate with you in, in terms on terms that are understandable to you, that are a part of your own character and your personality. God says, I'm doing something generationally 
in the two of you. Wow. Uh, I'm making investments in the two of you, and you're not going to be left out of my purposes, and you're not going to be left out of my plans. I know that said, my plan for you is a good plan, and I am disposed, says the Father, to bless you in ways that you might not think is possible. Well, that's not possible. Well, I don't know. God says, yes, it will. And get ready for sooner, not later. Amen. Get ready for sooner, not later. And when it happens, I see you sitting in a restaurant and say, well, that guy... He said something about sooner or not later. There it is. And the Lord says, that's your portion. I am disposed, I am disposed to bestow my blessing and to demonstrate my love for Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Broke out in sweat. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, don't sweat it. Now, <laughs> if you have not received a word, I want you to promise me if you want a word, get our card, go to the website, make a request, be sure and mention St. Michael's. I will escalate your request to make sure you hear from us. Something else I decided to do, and this is a first, we've never done this. If you're here and you've had you've had a couple chances to hit the book table and you haven't been able to buy a book and you want to buy a book, you want to have a book, you want to have a CD, we want to give to you. We want to give to you. If you want a book, I, I ask you to go back and please, just for yourself. You yeah. can take more than one item, but just for yourself. Don't take for your uncles, aunts, second cousins. <laughs> just for you. I want to encourage you as our gift to you because we love you. And we want you to be blessed. You go visit that book table, and if you see something you want, you take it with you as our, and our gift. Card. And be sure and take our business card. Um, we're coming back here in October next of next year. year. It may be this very place. We're going to work all of that out. I want you to know it's been an honor. It's been an honor and a privilege to wash your feet in the prophetic. Thank you so much for taking care of us. It's been a super blessing. It's been yeah. so good and such a blessing to be here. Amen. Praise God. You want to say anything? I just want to say thank you because we feel so much love. We feel like your family. Like if we, we could go home with any of you and cook us a nice supper. Or something. <laughs> That's how warm and cozy you are. You're so easy to love. The love of God is certainly emanating from each of your lives. Pastor Isabel, thank you very, very much. Oh, could you minister to us? But of course you can. But of course you can. Be sure and hold the microphone. Tanya, House of Joys. We're all prophets. Uh -huh. Everybody can prophesy. Yep. We this prophesy. is for Russ and Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> and if any of you, any, any of you have a word for Liz? <laughs> Brenda? <clears throat> Here, you want to hold this so the people can hear you okay? I just put it up, give it to him. I'm, I'm not quite ready, but I did want some offer and I wanted to give Thank it to you. Thank so you, much. sister. So this is what the Lord told me earlier today. He Hold told the microphone so the people can Oh, I'm hear. sorry, I'm sorry. This is what the Lord told me today, that he's going to use you like Ezekiel. You're going to bring the dead board bones back to life. Yeah. He said in not one place, in every place you walk, the people are going to come back to life. And when they come back to life, they're going to be so appreciative, they're going to give unto your bosom. That you'll see money coming from strange places, and you'll and they'll say, "Well, I saw you here. I saw you here." <coughs> but there's more to it. Hallelujah! And you're going to start laying hands on people, not just for healing, but for the transfer of the anointing. That's what I hear really strong, and especially. Like you said today, the fivefold, but especially the apostle and the prophet. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Well, I, um, the thing that, I guess, witnessing my spirit, it, it, it is a word that I've heard you say yourselves over and over since you've been here, is that elevation mm -hmm. and promotion. Amen. And I really felt strongly that the Lord is planning to do that for you. Um, and an elevation in, in quantity and quality. Of the, of the miraculous, amen, uh, as uh, Pastor Isabel had said, you, you know, you're going to 
be doing miracles, but um, I, I, what I felt was that the Lord is saying He's going to do so many miracles that you won't be able to be directly involved with all of them. So it'll be your team doing a lot of the work. I mean, they'll be laying hands on and seeing miracles. They'll be doing things that are in your heart to do, and they'll just intuitively know and begin to walk forth and, and do those things. So, amen. And the other thing that was in my heart was that... Um, that we should just pray a you know a blessing for you. So can I do that? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, yes. all right. So Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful couple that you have sent in our midst, yes. oh God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for every word that has proceeded out of your mouth through them, oh God. Yes. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for every soul that turned out, oh God, to receive yes. from your hand through them, oh Lord. And so, Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you are indeed indeed giving them the kingdom we father we are so reminded of how you have said in your word you say thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven your agenda in earth as it is in heaven and so father because they have set their heart towards your agenda we pray lord that you will indeed bless them even as they have blessed us in this place, O oh God. Father, we believe, Lord, that as they have sown into us and labored for our sake, O oh God, Father, that they should receive benefit back from the labor that they have sown. So, Father, we know, Lord, that perhaps we've not had the monetary blessing that we desire to give, Father, but that you will multiply what they have received, O oh God, that you would multiply yes. the impact of it, O oh Lord. And Father, we just thank you for them, and we thank you for their compassion, and for their heart toward your cause in the earth. And all who agree, say amen. 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 Tom, you have something before we close. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. What I saw in the spirit were stained glass windows, and God said that he is going to send you to more churches. There'll be more churches that will call upon you to bring you for to bring about a change in their congregation. So God said, be on the lookout. Look through your emails. There will be plenty of people who are just going to hear about you. They don't even know anything about you yet, but they'll hear a word about you and they'll contact you to come and speak a word over their ministry. Praise God. Wow. Wow. Receive it. Wow. I just heard the Lord say he has descended in our midst and God said this is a time of the revealing of the truth and a time of resetting and he says there's been a lot of false teaching he says there's been some folks that he did not call neither did he send that has led the people astray and then he said there's some that have come and have compromised and have turned the people but God says you're the real deal and that he is going to use you to correct that which has been muttered over. He's going to use you to reset because people believe we are serving a powerless God. But he said he is powerful and all power and glory is in his hand. And so you are, he will, more churches, you'll be moving more about, but it is, and you'll be utilized in this place of the reveal, the illumination as God is coming to release truth. Watch your preach. <laughs> I'm sitting back there shaking. But you know what? The Lord told me come forth. I had to prophesy to you. You, God, is going to use you mainly in the visionaries. He's going to show you things. He's going to show you people before you see them. And when you go to speak, you're going to know them people in the spirit. Because he sent me here today to tell you. I saw you in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. You were talking to somebody, and as quick as you were prophesying to them, you saw a vision of their childhood. I'm shaking, but I got to tell you. God's going to use you. Can I hug you? Yeah. <laughs> Both arms. Yeah. Both arms. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, 
Praise God. God bless you. Again, please visit the book table. If you see something there that would be a blessing to you, you're welcome to take it. Consider yourselves dismissed. Thank you again for coming. He thinks I'm weird, but whenever the Holy Spirit gets on him, he starts sweating like fucking so much. What do you do for him? That's what he does. He just got a job, and he's in manufacturing. He's a supervisor. And I want to jump on the screen. <laughs> and then, and then they make him work really long hours and don't pay them. They work like 17 hour days and stuff. And I said, God, I'm going to give my son a better job or give him a better job. I saw him promoted. I saw him in a manufacturing plant. He was up in this office up above, and that he, he was like one of those, like you said, lead dogs. You know? Well, you know, he was in Iraq. He was in Iraq twice, and he, he retired from the army. He retired from the army. They have children. No, they want children. God was talking to me about that. I've been praying. I said, God, can I have one grandchild? <laughs> so, Do they have, is there problems? Well, they said that she doesn't ovulate like she should. And they went through, what do you call it? I think so, what treatment? But it didn't work. Get ready. She's fixing that bread. Yeah. You can let him know I asked that question when I brought it up. Okay. I thank you for everything. Uh, I can't, I want to cry. I can't thank you for how much I see. Anything I can do for you, let me know. Okay. And I look forward to coming back next year. Okay. And I pray next year, I, I try to advertise this year on Facebook and stuff. Well, with your permission. Do anything you want. See, you don't need my permission. What happens is sometimes I bring people in and it gets in the way of what people want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do whatever you want. A lot of times we won't do that, but they can't accept something. You know, they don't understand them. People want to come from D.C. and stuff, too. Some days you can do that kind of thing. So, we'll open it up. I know we could double. Yeah, well, I get a little play from it. This is a perfectly fine place. Okay. 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 I have a question to ask you. Remember, I think I can't remember the time, but I'm hoping I'm going to do that. Yeah, think of the house like the house of the Lord. That's the church of Christ. I believe what the Lord is showing is what your ministry is supposed to look like.